Hi there, Karen O'Connor here to wrap up this series on achieving and maintaining an open throat for singing. I'm going to be discussing more parts of the vocal tract in this video, but I should be able to manage to keep it shorter than the last one because all these parts of the vocal instrument are interconnected and somewhat interdependent I ended up touching upon them a little bit in the previous video I decided to post the video on the low larynx first because when the larynx descends appropriately a lot of the other elements of the open throat just fall into place on their own in response so I'll get a little bit into more detail here and offer some more suggestions for configuring the components of the vocal tract to create a nice open resonating space that's comfortable and sustainable during singing. The pharynx, which extends from the area around the larynx to the area just behind the nose, is colloquially referred to as the throat. And so this is the part that we're trying to keep open and non-constricted during singing. So the pharynx is wider at the bottom. When the larynx lowers, it opens up the pharynx so that its wider base is more involved in resonation. And this contributes to greater depth, that oscuro that darkness factor of tone. So when the pharynx is wider and longer, the first formant, the lowest resonance frequency of the vocal tract is lowered further. And that's part of what results in this acoustic perception of the vowel and tone is having depth and warmth. So by lowering the larynx, what I discussed in the second video of this series, the lower portion of the pharynx is simultaneously widened. The open throat is important for the purposes of better amplification of vocal resonance. Not only does the larger space encourage the presence of more depth and warmth in the sound, but when the pharyngeal walls are firm due to the pharynx being relaxed and dilated, sound waves bounce more effectively off of them. When the pharyngeal walls are constricted and shortened, the looser tissue tends to absorb and attenuate rather than reflect and amplify the sound waves. Some teachers suggest using a pre-vomit posture to help achieve this open pharynx. Personally, I find the imagery associated with this technique to be a bit off-putting and it creates a negative emotional response in me. So I also find that in most singers who use this approach, the sound is overly dark and nearly as ugly as the sound of gagging and pre-vomiting. The same is often true of attempts at opening the throat using the yawn posture or even the beginning of the yawn posture. I know in the previous video on lowering the larynx, I did make a suggestion of using a yawn sigh to help release constrictor tensions, especially in the upper middle and upper range. Calling upon these kinds of natural bodily reflexes simply has to be done with within certain parameters. Essentially, they should never be taken too far to the point where any of the vocal tract's parts are forced into postures that are uncomfortable, uh, discourage mobility or flexibility, or encourage resonance distortions. If they can't be sustained comfortably, then they're probably not where they should be. It is possible for the pharynx to become overly distended. I've read of some teachers suggesting that students of voice should feel a sense of openness as though they could fit an entire piece of fruit inside their throats, for example. If the singer feels a very large sense of space inside the throat, it's very likely that the vocal tract is actually being improperly configured. The sensation should be that of openness and freedom, true, but there's no need to force the throat unnaturally open. I still find the most effective imagery for opening up the throat is simply the inhalare la voce concept that I briefly explained in my low larynx video. Others like to use the imagery of inhaling a pleasant fragrance, such as that of a rose or the aroma of your favorite food. Uh, the important thing to remember is that we just don't want to push the voice out of us using the throat muscles because that will cause the pharynx to constrict. This is the really fascinating thing about the pharynx. It narrows by way of a sphincter action. It actually contains no muscles for opening or dilating it as a whole. Only a group of three circular constrictor muscles on the outside layer and a group of three paired longitudinal muscles on the inside that shorten and widen the pharynx and elevate the larynx during swallowing. The contraction of these pharyngeal constrictor muscles pushes food down the esophagus during swallowing. So these pharyngeal muscles are actually part of the swallow mechanism that we need to disengage during singing tasks. We need to release the constrictor muscles. One way to experience the openness of the pharynx and disengagement of the swallow reflex is to get a good deep inhale through the mouth and then hold your breath briefly while keeping your cheeks sunken in. I like to put my hands here 
and I to ensure that the cheeks are sinking in to that space between the upper and lower sets of molars. And then you're going to hold this for just a few seconds. And when you hold your breath in, you're going to do it with a closed mouth not puffy cheeks like squirrels with nuts inside them. And then you're not going to close the glottis when you do this, right? So when you do this again, you're going to add to this. You're going to inhale, close the mouth, then you're going to open the mouth, but you're not going to move in air, air in and out. So it's going to be like the second phase of the Farinelli exercise. If ever you do that, I'll explain that exercise some other time, where you're basically retaining the air and suspending the breath cycle momentarily as you do this. So you're going to keep the glottis open, and your vocal tract is going to be like an open tube. No air is going to be moving in and out because there's going to be no respiratory muscles moving that air in and out, expanding the thoracic cavity, the rib cage. Now, don't exhale here. Again, you want to kind of be like that open tube, putting that posture on pause. And then the third time you go through this, you're gonna do the same thing. Inhale, hold very, very briefly at the mouth level. I always just, again, keep your, your hands here if it helps so that you don't go like that. And now what we're going to do is we're going to inhale and we're going to re re suspend that breath cycle briefly and then exhale. Now as we exhale, we're going to just slowly let that air out. We're not going to push it out actively. For me, this exercise conjures up the imagery of intubation in which a doctor slides a tube down a patient's throat to prevent the airway from constricting. So if this imagery is not too off-putting for you, maybe you can think of there being an imaginary tube down your throat that's going to prevent it from constricting and narrowing. So after you've spent some time retraining your pharynx in silence, then you can reintroduce phonation and try to keep the same feeling as you exhale. So again, restructure the voice in silence. Practice doing this a lot in silence before you reintroduce voicing. Some speech language pathologists use ingress of phonation to help their patients achieve a non-constricted throat. Essentially, the patient phonates while the air is moving into the lungs. <sighs> This is almost like the inhalare le voce concept, but taken literally. This can help to open up the throat and deactivate the pharyngeal constrictor muscles and the shortener muscles, but it does use different glottal closure and vocal fold vibration patterns, and I'm not thoroughly convinced that it mimics the egressive phonation in which air flows out of the lungs during phonation that characterizes singing. So this is why I find that the inhalare le voce concept works most effectively at opening the throat. The false folds or ventricular or vestibular folds lie above the true vocal folds and are parallel but slightly lateral to them. These false folds differ from the true vocal folds in their biomechanical properties. Unlike the true vocal folds, they're lined with respiratory epithelium rather than stratified squamous epithelium, and they do not contain muscle, whereas the true vocal folds have skeletal muscle. This means that they're not designed to carry out the same functions as the true vocal folds. They don't play a role in normal phonation, and this is why they're called the false folds. However, they can be recruited in pathological conditions such as vocal fold paralysis and they may start vibrating either periodically or not and sometimes simultaneously with the true vocal folds to compensate for glottal insufficiency and underactivity of the true vocal folds. The false folds are also used in some forms of overtone singing as well as vocal distortion including musical screaming and death metal growl techniques. The false vocal folds are brought together by throat constriction, narrow, the narrowing of the supralaryngeal vocal tract enough to adduct these folds. Their approximation can interfere with the vibration of the true vocal folds, which can lead to a rough strained voice quality as well as higher than normal subglottic pressure. So, for most phonation and most styles of singing, the ventricular, the false folds, should be retracted so that they don't hamper normal voice production and will allow for the openness in the resonator in the throat. This movement is not easily controlled by conscious effort and it's best facilitated at the time of deep, relaxed inhalation when the throat is opened. So, retraction of the false folds occurs during deep inhalation 
as the pharynx opens in preparation for singing, but it can also be accomplished using a silent or suppressed laughter as though you're stifling a laugh, or even sob quality. Same kind of feeling when I do that. It's a good idea to explore the feeling of various degrees of false vocal fold retraction. To do this, you can take in different kinds of breaths. First, an audible, somewhat noisy breath through the mouth. And that's partial false vocal fold approximation. Then you can take in a very noisy breath in and out, obtaining the feeling of difficulty drawing air in and expelling it out again. And that's full false vocal fold constriction. It may be helpful to almost imagine that you're stuck in a desert begging for water. Water, water. And then finally, you can take a silent breath with the open feeling in the throat. It's silent because there's no turbulent air. Nice and relaxed and open throat. I can take it in much more efficiently and release it in a much more relaxed manner. The throat isn't shutting down to do that. The tongue root is involved in opening up the throat because it's down inside the pharynx. It's low enough that we can't actually see it. If the tongue root is pulled backwards, it takes up a bunch of space inside the pharynx, thereby making less space inside the throat for resonation. So, a retracted tongue root will not enable the open throat. The tongue root needs to lean up against the front wall, the anterior wall of the pharynx, so that it's taking up as little space inside the throat as possible. Inhaling with the tongue in the ah position can help to get the tongue root out of the way. Ah. The ah vowel is a near open front vowel, so it's produced with the tongue both lowered away from the hard palate and forward inside the mouth, so there's little narrowing constriction or obstruction of the airflow, and the tongue root naturally wants to sit a little bit more forward. I've also offered an imagery of, a, of the tongue rolling forward atop a miniature exercise ball or conveyor belt to try to get that uh, tongue root leaning up against the front wall of the throat, as well as an exercise for retraining the tongue root in two previous videos. We can also simply practice inhaling and exhaling, then phonating with the tongue slightly forward, sitting atop either the lower teeth or the lower lip. We just want to watch that the tongue doesn't dip or retract inside the mouth, and it doesn't narrow. We want to stretch the tongue body out toward the insides of the cheeks. As I mentioned in the low larynx part of this video series, we also have to achieve an independence of function between the tongue root and the larynx, and learn to be able to lower the larynx without the assistance of downward tongue root pressure. Taming the tongue root at the time of deep inhalation will help to ensure that the larynx descends automatically on its own while the tongue root remains released. A tense tongue root alters vocal timbre and resonance, which can disguise the singer's true vocal foch, the voice classification. So tra and then training in the wrong classification can compromise vocal health over time. I should note that jaw posture also plays a small role in the singer's ability to be able to open the throat. If the jaw is too far back, for example, there will be pressure against the hyoid bone and the shape of the throat will be changed somewhat. If the larynx rises excessively, the singer may intuitively slide the jaw forward to make more room for the elevated hyoid bone. The soft palate, also known as the velum, forms the partition between the mouth and the pharynx. The uvula, which looks a little like a miniature punching bag, dangles from the top of the soft palate. The palatal glossal arches on either side of the soft palate are included in the soft palate complex. And during swallowing in the production of most speech sounds, the uvula retracts and it helps to close off the nasal passages. Because I've already posted a video on eliminating nasality from the singing tone, which explains some reasons why the soft palate might fail to elevate, and discusses some strategies for raising the soft palate, and because I've already discussed the soft palate's role in opening the throat in the low larynx video, I'm going to keep this part of today's video really brief. The throat can be open whether the soft palate is raised or lowered. It has to be lowered for breathing through the nose and for nasal phonemes. In English, this includes only M, N, and NG. 
but there is a need for soft palate elevation during the singing of all vowels in the English language to avoid unwanted nasalization as well as the trapping of resonance in behind a lowered soft palate so it's considered a component of the open throat posture. Soft palate elevation is somewhat affected by the height of the tongue because the palatoglossal arches and the base of the tongue share some common muscle attachments. So if you're using the tongue root to falsely depress the larynx, you may also cause the soft palate to fall or at the very least to have a harder time remaining elevated and also wide. So now you have more tensions to contend with and a bunch of distortions on top of all of that. As we inhale deeply through the mouth, the soft palate ideally rises and widens. This can be assisted by an inhaled, almost inaudible k. So this draws the tongue body away from the soft palate and because the plosive k sound requires a buildup of air pressure behind the point of closure between the tongue and the soft palate, the nasal port has to be completely closed. That means that the soft palate has to be up. At the same time, it helps if we elevate the zygomatic muscles that raise the cheeks up under the eyes in a subtle, pleasant facial expression. For centuries, classical singing teachers have been telling their students that this lift of the zygomatic muscles will help to lift the soft palate. However, there is actually no muscular connection between these two, but when we lift, especially when we're using imagery, mental imagery that conjures up pleasant feelings, the soft palate is inspired to lift too. So that's probably how this connection in vocal pedagogy came about or came to be made. Well, there you have it. As you start to coordinate your vocal apparatus more, you'll start to find it easier to open up the throat in preparation for your singing tasks at the time of deep inhalation. And then over time, be able to maintain that same degree of openness as you sing. As I've said all along, it does take time to retrain your vocal tract to undo and eliminate those constrictor tensions that are habitual and chronic. So be patient with yourself be really diligent about this and spend a lot of time just restructuring your voice. Do this in silence first and then really, add, as you're singing, really focus on what you're doing and maintaining that sensation of openness. Don't revert back to your old habits of pushing with the throat muscles to try to push your sound out and to push the air out. As always, I welcome your comments and questions below in emails addressed to Karen at SingWise.com or messages on the SingWise Facebook page. And please like this video if you found it helpful and subscribe to this channel so that you'll receive notifications whenever I post new videos. Thank you so much for watching today.